You know, one thing that's really useful is to to really try to either make yourself or invite in somebody else to the conversation to make the strongest pro and con argument that you possibly can. It's like if you're thinking you might want to try something, but you're not so sure about it, don't just hear from the person that thinks it's a great idea. Find somebody that seems smart and articulate, but that hates the idea and ha have a conversation with them too. You know, the marketplace of ideas is, is what we want going on inside each of our heads so we can be, you know, smart shoppers. That's Jesse Lawler, and this is episode 207 of Wellness Force Radio. What's up, my friend? It's your host, Josh Trent, and welcome back to another episode for your weekly access to global experts in all things wellness as we discover the physical and emotional intelligence we need to live life well. In this episode, we're welcoming back Jesse Lawler, my friend and podcast host from Smart Drug Smarts for his three-peat appearance on Wellness Force. And we're talking about something today that most people have a huge blind spot about, and that is cognitive bias and its relationship to psychic injury. These things that happen in our past that shape our current reality, and if left unchecked, our future. Well, these can be directed from this evolution of psychic injury. And it's a fascinating topic of which Jesse is a profound expert. In hundreds of episodes as the host of Smart Drug Smarts and decades studying human cognition, this episode is exploring the deeper recesses of the conscious and subconscious mind so that by the end of the show, you'll be able to do the work in uncovering your own cognitive biases and beginning the healing path from psychic injury that may have been imprinted to the mind. This podcast is brought to you by our partnership with IntelliSkin. They make human technology, which is this smart compression that pulls your shoulders back throughout the day. You've probably seen photographs of athletes like Kelly Slater, multiple NBA teams, and recently, we had our early surf movement masterclass photographs that were released where Dr. Tim Brown spoke about how critical posture is. And if you've been on the fence to try this human technology, the smart compression, give it a test drive over at IntelliSkin.net. Use code WF20. They give you 20% off your entire order. That's IntelliSkin.net for 20% off using code WF20 that actually helps you breathe more from your belly. Deep breaths are so important. It helps you pull your shoulders back, whether you're at the sitting desk or the standing desk. It's incredible. I know you're going to get so much from this smart compression. Give it a test drive over at IntelliSkin.net. Now, if you listen to the previous two shows with Jesse, which are linked in the show notes, we talked so in depth about cognitive performance and enhancement with nutrition tropics, and more of the neuroscience and biology of axons, neurons, action potential. You know, the super kind of cool, sciencey, geeky, fun stuff like dendrites and motor cortex. But what I love most about Jesse is his desire for this continual frontier. You know, the one place we're all going. We explore this on the show today and cover topics like the replication crisis in research, the bandwagon effect for different diets, vegan, paleo, vegetarian, keto, the power of looking at pros and cons in decision making and the dangers of groupthink, how to avoid this. We also talk about the role of psychedelics in healing and re-imprinting past tragedies and what Jesse believes we all can do just a handful of things every single day to improve our emotional intelligence by exploring these cognitive biases. Show notes from today are wellnessforce.com forward slash 207. Make sure you give Jesse a shout on social media, on the interwebs. Let him know you heard him here on Wellness Force Radio. All right, let's step in right now with Jesse Lawler. So we know that lies can be something we tell ourselves, but we also know that lies are something that once we tell ourselves that lie, other people tend to believe it. This emotional contagion, we've talked about this with Gretchen Rubin on the show, but today we're bringing back Jesse Lawler for a three-peat third time on the show. We're talking about cognitive bias evolving from psychic injury. Jesse, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. People already know you, but if they don't know you, if they haven't gone back in the annex of Wellness Force, give people just a quick and skinny on Jesse and why he's so fascinated with the brain. Ah, shucks. Um, well, I am a computer software developer by training, and uh, that sort of led me down the road of all things cognitive optimization. And I've, and I've always been into science and stuff, and so the two sort of naturally go together. I've been for the last five plus years now running a podcast called Smart Drug Smarts, which started kind of as my personal dive into looking at nootropics and drugs that we can take to improve the workings of our brain. And at this point has kind of, you know, feathered out into a lot of neuroscience related research and just, you know, looking at how our brains 
work, how they can be made to last longer and you know preserve them in health as long as possible, and also what we can do for sort of you know short term upticks to uh, you know make them function in an as needed basis as well as possible. Smart Drug Smarts. Every episode I hear, it's like this ultimate masterclass in all things cognition, brain health, and honestly, man, human optimization. Since you started the show, has it gone in any different directions that you never even knew it was going to go since from the beginning? Well, you know, it's like I started the show thinking that I was not going to get bored of the brain. It wouldn't be something I was going to, you know, want to bail on after, you know, 10 or 20 episodes. But I, I wouldn't have necessarily predicted that I would be 200 episodes deep and counting, which is where we're at now. I think it'll be episode number 226 this week. But, you know, th there's there's no lack of research going on. In fact, I think the amount of brain research going on now is probably you know, greater than at any point in human history. A lot of that's because there's more scientists now than at any point in human history, which is yeah. kind of a interesting and unsung fact that I feel like a lot of people aren't really aware of. And then the other thing is just technology has improved so much in the past couple of decades that things that used to be social science experiments are now much more actual neuroscience experiments where they're looking at, you know, what, what sections of the brain are active and how active, you know, what's the blood flow like to, you know, the medulla when I do, you know, wiggle my pinky toe or whatever it is. Yeah. And there's so many tools out there too. It's like, we know that there's the headphones you can wear that'll activate your motor cortex. We know that there's human charger, which will shine light into your ear. And then we know that there's just good old fashioned human touch. So all these things can really uplift what our brain's already doing, which is have these connections fire how many times per second? I don't know. Maybe you'll know. But along that process, we also understand that the way we see things, Jesse, like they're not always the truth and they're stories that we tell ourselves. And really, this is why I'm excited to talk to you about cognitive and some of these fallacies, these biases that we yeah. evolve over time. How would you define this, man? Like, what's a cognitive bias for people that don't know? We feel like like logic is something that's obvious. Like, well, you know, a two-year-old has logic, and, and that's not really true. Logic is actually something that accrues over time as we get experience working with the world. And there are certain ways that our brain is almost kind of balanced to not be logical, where it has been advantageous for us to be overly cautious about certain things or, or, or less cautious than we should be about other things. And, and so where we're basically not on an even playing field where our brain doesn't predispose us to think rationally, where our brain actually predisposes us to think irrationally. So I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking all about that. But the um, Probably the classic example is attributing agency to things that aren't necessarily there. If, if I'm you know, walking on, on the plains of you know, whatever continent I live on you know, 50,000 years ago and I hear a rustle in the grass and I'm you know, maybe out on a hunting party by myself and no homies are around me, then it's better for me to assume that this might be a tiger hunting me and be wrong about that than to assume oh, it's probably just a stick and not be wrong. It's like the cost of failure yeah. on, on not thinking that this might actually be something that doesn't have my best interests at heart is really high. It's like I'm, I'm probably likely to get eaten. Whereas, you know, being wrong and like, oh, you know, it was, it was nothing, you know, no big deal. Maybe I'm embarrassed. Maybe it's, you know, somebody that jumps out at me and it's just one of my friends. But um, anyway, th there's just a, a, a really unbalanced, um, you know, success or failure ratio there on what is factually true. And so our brain is sort of, uh, you know, wired us to, to not worry about the facts, but just be more worried than we should be. And, and something like that is probably why we tend to attribute intentionality to all sorts of things, you know, whether that's, you know, seeing ghosts or, you know, believing in supernatural deities or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. And it, the fascinating part is that not only have you talked about this in episode 220 with Dr. Richard Nisbet, but he talked about really like we're sometimes winging it. <laughs> Right. Like winging it, it leads us to feel that we are just kind of like in a space where we're doing the right thing, but yet our intuition, it doesn't always steer us the right way. And you guys both talked about this in a 30 minute interview. It has really no predictive value of anything at all on how people will work together. Is this a, a definition? Is this an example of cognition and its bias? Yeah, that, that was that was a fascinating point that he made there, which is is just flies in the face of all of our intuitions. Uh, basically, he's saying that the standard way that people do hiring for businesses of you know having the last step in the process be this sort of all important make or break interview where the candidate for the job comes in and meets the people and talks with them for a while and and sort of you know says says why they want the job or you know why they'd be good for it or what their weaknesses might be. Um, all of that has 
almost no value compared to what was already sent in on their, you know, one or two page resume at the very beginning of the process. The amount of predictive value that you get from the resume as to how they will actually do in the job versus what you think you get from this, you know, really detailed seeing the color of shirt they wear, hearing how they pronounce their words, all that stuff from the 30 minute interview. It, it just has has almost no predictive value, even though it really feels intuitively to us like it would. Because people aren't necessarily being themselves or maybe they're being a version of themselves that's attached to some way of being or thinking that they believe there's a bias that they have to do in order to be successful. How many actual biases are there? Are there more than 100? I've seen reports there's 20, there's 58. I mean, what's the jury saying, man? How many cognitive biases do we have? I, I think this depends on on which scientist you're going to ask, because, I mean, a lot of them are probably related to one another and just depends on how how fine you want to slice and dice. But uh, but th there are a lot of ways that we are not um, you know naturally inclined to think strictly rationally about things. I love that you brought up the fact, too, about being in the field. Um, you know, that bias kept us alive. There's this zero risk bias I was looking at before we came on the show here. And sociologists have found that we love certainty, even if it's counterproductive. It eliminates risk entirely, meaning there's no chance of us ever being harmed. But then we also don't grow. I mean, that, in my example, is probably the worst bias I think human beings entertain. And that one is really interesting to look at how it changes over a lifetime, because when you think about it, like a baby takes all sorts of risks and really enjoys it. I mean, learning to walk is something that you know any human kind of needs to do. And it's just this really important thing. So despite the fact that falling down might hurt, it might be embarrassing, it might be whatever. And we obviously fail a whole lot and fall down a whole lot before we're ever able to master toddling around. It's just something that there's this inherent joy in getting it right because it's so important that we do in order to be able to move on to the next developmental steps. You know, once you're, you're like a 16, 17, 18 year old, you probably kind of know everything you really need to know. And at that point, like learning new stuff, I mean, there's there's only a limited number of things you need to learn once you know how to hunt and gather and, you know, what, what you know, songs you sing in your village and stuff like that. Yeah. There's not this whole wealth of, of world of knowledge out there. So at that point, it kind of makes sense to really retrench and get much more risk averse and, and become kind of reactionary in your outlook because – there's nothing more to learn if you live at that stage of history rather than the baby that has all sorts of stuff that they sort of need to learn on the way to becoming a functional adult in your your um, you know, pre-modern society. We're wired certain ways, you know, the first imprinting on our nervous system and, you know, really in the deep recesses of our brain ages, you know, zero through 10 conception through 10, they really channel our personality tendency types, our ways of being, how we interrelate with other people. I remember in our last episode, number 97, uh, you said optimists tend to be stronger responders to placebos. I'm curious if we could contrast nocebo placebo and then also these cognitive biases. How do you think these three interrelate? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. And unfortunately, they've done a lot more placebo versus nocebo studies. So I, th I think it's sort of an unbalanced study map out there right now. But placebo is basically a a false expectation that something you know good will happen or whatever happens won't be as bad as it actually will be. But it's, it's kind of like an optimistic but irrational expectation, which can kind of take on a weight of its own in the human mind. Nocebo is just the opposite. Nocebo is, is when you're sort of falsely brought to expect that something will be worse than it probably will be, mm. and that that negative expectation actually makes it worse than it might be. Um, and we're subject to both of these, and both of them have definite huge power over the human brain, but we've just done a lot more study on, on positive studies like placebo than on, on nocebo studies. I think for me, when we look at Joe Dispenza's work, I mean, he studies this in detail, in depth, which he would be a phenomenal. I would love to hear you interview Joe Dispenza. Have you ever considered that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not super familiar with his work. I mean, it does ring a bell, but okay. um, he has this entire dialogue around the power of thought. And it's for some people a little esoteric, a little woo woo. But, you know, he's also grounded in hardcore science, in the analytics and the data that come from watching someone's brain on a PET scan and seeing yeah. what happens during the power of thought. We also know, Jesse, that when it comes to bias, there's so many people out there, especially in health and wellness, they seek all this information. But I think their subconscious knows they're not actually going to do anything with it. And actually, there's a lot of studies out there that show more info is not always better. Like less info, people can often make more accurate decisions and predictions. Do you feel the same way or do you differ in that regard? Well, have you had an episode on your show where you've talked about the a study looking at varieties of it was like 
Cheetos or something like that in a, in a grocery store where like if you give people three choices, they analyze the, uh, the options available to them and they make a choice. But you give them like 35 choices of the same thing. <laughs> and even though everybody yeah. intuitively we think, oh, more choices is good. Like we believe that's what we want. But if you actually present us with that, it's like, oh, boy, that's uh, I don't want to read each one of these 35 containers. Um, yeah, and then you wind up either just not making a choice like opting out entirely or making just like grabbing the first one and making a completely uneducated choice versus at least yes. like looking over the top three. Oh my gosh. And it's almost like in a way, the dovetail of placebo, nocebo and cognitive bias, how they kind of dance together. I almost feel in a way that that gathering information is a way for people to get so exhausted by decision fatigue that they know they're not going to make a decision because they're quote, so exhausted. Yeah, there, there's a, a book recommendation, and I, I'm going to throw out this recommendation, even though I haven't read the whole book. So, uh, you know, uh, word of warning called Algorithms to Live By, and it's written by a computer scientist, mathematician type, basically looking at ways that people can use algorithms, which uh, algorithm is basically just like a, a recipe for behavior is, is all that means. It sounds like a big word, but it's not. But so, sort of a recipes for behavior that can help fight some of our, our natural biases. Like, you know, one of them is – when you, when you are trying to make a selection on something that there's potentially an unlimited amount of choices on, like you know, a dating website would be a great example. Um, you know, oftentimes one one of the better things we can do is kind of set out our our minimum viable set of expectations, and then like you know wait until we get over that set of expectations three times. And once we have three things that are over that set of expectations, just pick the best of the three, and mm -hmm. assume like it, it varies from one domain to the next, but your chances of getting something that are way, way, way better than anything that is beyond like that first group of three that have made it over your, your minimum rung for success is probably just going to be wasted time. And of course, you know, some of these things, it depends like what the time horizon on making a decision is. It's obviously if you're you know looking for a marriage partner and you're 17, that's a different sort of constellation of choices than if you're looking for a marriage partner and you're 87. And yes, but yeah, algorithms to live by would be a really interesting one for anybody to uh, check out. At some point, every human being gets what science calls psychic woundage. Uh, and I think really this is an imprint that kind of further perpetuates a bias that we have. This psychic wounding, I mean, is this just trauma? Is it something that we're perceiving as trauma? What actually imprints the psychic wound in our in our mind? Yeah, well, uh, you and I were talking offline a couple of weeks ago about a book that I read a while ago and I thought was fantastically interesting. This was actually written before either of us were born, but it was called The Uses of Enchantment by Brunel Bettelheim. And it's actually talking about fairy tales, like, you know, kids' fairy tales and and why they have stuck around and, and like why kids, like when they fall in love with a fairy tale and they want the parent to read it like 5, 10, 20, 30, 100 times and the parents just bored out of their skull. Like, what is it about this story that keeps this kid so engaged? But but oftentimes stories that engage a kid at a certain point in their their psychological development is like there's a really important, you know, underlying something or another about how how that kid as a young being sort of fits into society yeah. that they're grappling with. And um, anyway, I just found it a fascinating book. And, and one of the theses of, of his book, and I'm, I'm hoping I can do it justice here in a short time, is that every human being uh, – at, at some point between, you know, first being born and popping out into the world and becoming an adult within their society ha has sort of a, a first big moment of reckoning where something really lets them down, really violates their expectations that they're this little, you know, God king of the universe. And if if you grow up in, you know, a, a really stressful surroundings, you, you might get that on day one out the womb. Whereas if you're kind of, you know, put on a pedestal and you've got a really, you know, loving, supportive family around you and you're really, you know, nurtured and protected, it, you might be, you know, 16, 17 before something like really, really comes crashing down on you. Like, you know, maybe the first person you fall in love with spurns you. And, and like that was the first time that the world didn't like live up to your expectations of what you were taught to expect. But anyway, the, the gist of, of Bettelheim's thesis is that the developmental age that a person is at when they have their first big scrap that they lose with reality really kind of sets in motion sort of the psychic trajectory for the rest of their life is like trying not necessarily to to um, address that wrong, although oftentimes it is that, but at least trying to like kind of understand 
you know, how was it that I misunderstood the world so much that it came and smacked me in this particular way? Yes. And, you know, the difference between somebody that receives a psychic wound when they're when when they're two and is still trying to you know, figure out like the most important thing in their world is like, how, how do bathroom things work? Like what is poop versus, <laughs> you know, the, the, the psychic wound that appears when you're like, you know, 14 and first starting to feel like the, the feelings of love and romance. It's like those are two different people in the way that they are going to, um, you know, probably address psychological things and what's going to motivate them going forward throughout their life. Basically, I think that we all get imprinted and we have events that happen through us, to us, or for us, however you want to look at it. And then we spend the rest of our adult life working through those, using those to our advantage. But I think a lot of people are either scared of that or they just don't even know those things are there, those events, those imprints. Do you believe that people get confused or what is people's general kind of like understanding of cognitive bias? Yeah, well, I, I guess in general, people really don't understand how pervasive it is, or they think that cognitive bias is something that everybody else suffers from, but not me personally. I mean, I, I think honestly, that's probably how most of us go through the world. Yeah. Um, it, it's worth maybe making a quick diversion to talk about optical illusions, because I feel like optical illusions are something that we've all experienced and that we, we see them, you know, we, we look at the, you know, the MC Escher painting or whatever, like these impossible shapes or the thing where the, like the two lines look like they're different lengths and then you measure them with a ruler and you prove to yourself that they're not. You, regardless of what you know to be factually true, you cannot unsee an optical illusion if, if it's, if it's one of that type of illusion. Um, and, and being aware that we, you know, our, our perceptual systems can just, you know, misdeal us information in that way. I feel like optical illusions present a, a really compelling argument that we're probably doing the same thing in all sorts of non-perceptual ways, things that aren't like, you know, what color is this dress or, you know, what, what is the comparative length of these two lines? We have much more, um, well, like we said, cognitive biases that, that don't show up in the perceptual realm, but do show up in the, you know, the realm of human relationships. You know, one that there's probably, I guess, maybe the great grandpappy of cognitive biases is something called the fundamental attribution error. And th that's one actually that I spoke a lot with uh, Dr. Richard Nisbet about also. But what that is, is essentially kind of the, you know, walk a mile in somebody else's moccasins error, where we are always completely aware of the context of our own decisions, which is why they seem reasonable to us. Not realizing that just because they seem reasonable to us, won't you know that won't be worth a glass of water to anybody else, and vice versa. How do we explain these flat earthers then? Like, what's their bias? Like, we know the Earth isn't flat; it's round. <laughs> we have photographs of the Earth, people. Um, what's the deal with that? You know, you know, it's funny. If flat earthers, people have been talking about them a bunch recently. Um, I, I want to meet a flat earther. Like, I, I, I wonder if like flat earthers are a conspiracy theory. Like, I, I don't know anybody that actually purports to be one. Okay. So I, I feel completely um, <laughs> like I'm beating up a straw man if I try to you know talk about what what they're thinking. Just because yes. I don't know anybody that thinks that. Let's contrast this then. Okay, so we're in the World Wide Web. We're connected. We're talk you and I are talking through the World Wide Web. What is the internet's impact on cognitive biases for people? Oh, wow. Okay. Boy, that that's a great question. You you might have accidentally like un uncorked my head from you know something that'll keep me talking for the next twenty five minutes. But so I, I came up with this. Um everybody's heard of peak oil. I, I think I coined the term peak reality a couple of years ago. And I, I think we've already probably passed peak reality. I, I think peak reality was probably, you know, sometime within the past 10 years, but so much of the information that each of us get day in, day out now is coming through some sort of digitally mediated stream rather than from our own direct senses, whether it's this conversation that we're having, you know, as you, as you say, over the internet or, you know, news that we're reading that somebody else heard, it was written down, it was transmitted to us, blah, blah, blah. If you lived, you know, 200 years ago and you were a, you know, gentleman farmer or whatever, it's like, you got a lot of your information through like the work of your own hands. It's like, I, I know how the soil works because, you know, I dig the soil with my own shovel and, and stuff like that. You had like all this first person experience with the world and you might not know a whole lot, but the things that you did know, a lot of it you knew from direct experience. It was not mediated by any third party. You, you know, you got the source on your hands from, from doing the stuff yourself. And I feel like that is, is, I mean, it's good that that's changing because we're not all gentlemen farmers anymore. But, but, <laughs> yes. but on the other hand, it's like we're getting so little of our experience and our information and what we build our belief systems on from stuff that we directly participate in. And that will only continue to be the case. It's like if, if 
think of all the different scientific studies that are going on now and and people that are really pressing the ground forward on on any one of those domains are so specialized with so many years of study in that particular subdomain of the subdomain that really they can only talk intelligently within that domain on other people that are vetted experts in that field. And they kind of have to throw bones back to the rest of us like, hey, here's what we found out and you kind of have to take our word for it to a certain degree. And and so I, I just feel like the fact that so much of the information that we get is via third parties, hopefully trusted third parties, but sure. not always. It's just going to lead to a, a proliferation of of kind of confusion and open room for doubt. I mean, not necessarily justified doubt, but but certainly room for skepticism on almost all the information we get now. And I, I really think it's fair to say that the greatest overarching challenge for humanity at this point is to come up with a system of um, – verifying factual claims in a way that will be accepted by the majority of the people. Because if we, if, if every conversation about, you know, he said, she said, or public policy or anything else needs to just turn into people yelling at one another because they can't define their terms correctly, or, or you can't agree to a definition, it's like, then we're just going to get nowhere. I mean, it, it, it becomes a shouting match. And you know. wow, <laughs> there is so much to unpack there, Jesse. Okay, let me pull the e-break because when you first started talking, we understand that there's peer reviewed studies. But then we also know that these peer reviewed studies, they have certain biases, even if they are peer reviewed, like what if your peer reviewed studies are from the peers that are in your same field that maybe get paid by the same pharmacology? departments or the same sponsors, whatever it is, that's the first question is, how do we actually know what's on the internet is really true? And, and don't you think that it's our responsibility, it's our increasingly powerful responsibility to have a vetting mechanism within our own cognition that's not biased on anything and just seeing information for how it truly is? Yeah, I, I, I think yes. But the question is, like, how is that actually tactically accomplished in real life? And, and honestly, I don't feel like we have a good answer to that question yet. I feel like we're all struggling to kind of come to grips with that of like, you know, how, how can I verify that the sources of my information today, you know, are correct? And yeah. even if we're talking strictly about something like science rather than politics, which we, we would like to think, you know, if it sort of comes down from the hallowed halls of research science, we should take it fairly seriously. But there's something called the replication crisis that's been sort of a buzz in the science news for the last few years, where a lot of times a study will come out and it becomes news and hey, you know, such and such was discovered. But then somebody else tries to rerun the exact same study or what they what they believe is the exact same study and they come back with a different result. And, you know, fairly important scientific findings or, or at least ones that were fairly widely publicized uh, when they've tried to rerun those under laboratory conditions in different labs elsewhere, uh, they, they aren't able to sort of back up the original claim. And the, even even some um, groups of replication attempts have found like shockingly few replications actually go through as planned, which is is really scary. And there's sort of some some built in problems with sort of the scientific vetting process there because there there's not a whole lot of scientific accolades that go to the me too scientists who just rerun somebody else's experiment to confirm or deny it it's like they're not credited with the discovery or you know the, their face on you know the, the the cover of the big scientific publication or whatever it is mm. if they just say yeah that guy that that uh, that thing that that other group of scientists found out a couple of years ago that still seems to be true it's like that just doesn't make much of a headline but um, on the other hand, the cost of not having things verified, it could also be quite high. The bandwagon effect, this is a huge bias. It's like, you know, some group of people, whether it might be paleo or keto or vegetarian or vegan, we see this so much, Jesse, in the diet world where there's a bandwagon effect, this contagion of, well, it worked for my neighbor, so it has to work for me. That is where I believe we really start to self-destruct with these biases. Like what are in your mind the top ones that we should really be aware of, these biases that can actually harm us, our health? Yeah, I, I guess jumping in too soon on something because uh, like we, we our hopefulness alarms are are ringing hard and kind of like, hey, this worked for my neighbor or my neighbor said this worked for him. It's like none of us really know <laughs> unless our neighbor was in a uh, you know peer reviewed study exactly what it was our neighbor is doing. If our neighbor is anything like we are, then we know that in any given day in our lives – there's not just one variable. There's a whole slew of variables going on. Yeah. So um, oftentimes to reduce 
you know, what's going on in our theoretical neighbor's life down to exactly one input can be really premature. I mean, on the, on the other hand, you know, sometimes a, a major life change like, you know, switching to a ketogenic diet in your example, it's like that, that probably will have effects. It'd be strange if it didn't. B- but on the other hand, I, I, th- I think, you know, pre-educating oneself on both the good and the bad potentials of anything that you're going to be trying, uh, you know, whether that's going to affect you physiologically or personally or whatever is probably well worth doing. I, I think as far as fighting cognitive bias, I guess to tie it back to sort of, um, you know, the root of the discussion a little bit is to really try to either make yourself or invite in somebody else to the conversation to make the strongest pro and con argument that you possibly can. It's like if you're yeah. thinking you might want to try something, but you're not so sure about it, don't just hear from the person that thinks it's a great idea. Find somebody that seems smart and articulate, but that hates the idea and, and ha- have a conversation with them too. It's, it's like really having a, you know, the marketplace of ideas is is what we want going on inside each of our heads so we can be, you know, smart shoppers. I love that. Um, that's a great analogy. The marketplace of ideas. Sometimes we're purchasing crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I stole that one from Thomas Jefferson. That is that is not a lot of original. <laughs> Sometimes we purchase the correct things, though. And, and I found, too, just to kind of piggyback on your actionable. It's like, listen, if we're in a men's group or a women's group or some type of group where we're not just getting information and a mirror of how we're showing up from one type of person, a good example is I'm in a men's group. And so in my men's group, there's seven other people. They all have different backgrounds. Some have family, some don't. And so when we share in the group about what we're up to personally in our business, in our lives, in our love life, we get feedback from other individuals who are at different stages in their life. I feel like that is a way to wash out some of these cognitive biases, you know, these blind spots that are talked about in emotional intelligence training so much that we don't even know we don't know are there. Have you seen this be something that the literature or people on your podcast have been talking about this work with other human beings to wash out the biases that hurt us. You know, that that's not really the type of thing that we would go into so much on my podcast, but my, my own personal take on that is that it's really useful, but I, I'm also a little bit suspicious of groups in that because I, th- I think group think is, is definitely a danger. It's like if you're in a, a group of, you know, 10 or 12 people, um, what the first person says, sort of that, you know, the primacy effect or priming can really affect what everybody else says. It's like if I, if I spill my guts on, hey, here's a problem I'm having, how should I address it? And, you know, the first person to speak up is sort of one of the more dominant members of the group and holds a lot of social capital among that group. And, and they voice their opinion on, on one side of it. It becomes harder for the other people to each voice their opinions if that's something that's going to conflict. Um, so I, I guess my own leaning is to try to seek out, n- not to not get a, a group of people giving me advice, but to try to get advice from from that group individually so that they're not coloring one another's, you know, what they might be saying. Ah, so even sitting in the same space with people could then bleed over for contagion. You know, the bandwagon effect could be uh, possibly in the group. Yeah, I mean, it, and it really depends on the group dynamics of that group, and some groups are going to be more like that than others. But especially if there's sort of a an established dominance hierarchy in that group, and the leader hasn't made it clear that you know he or she really uh, you know prefers that that adversarial ideas be brought to the table to kind of be batted around. Um, yeah, that that can really squelch dissent um, before you even get a chance to hear the dissent. If if a dominant member kind of says, "Hey, here's what I think." Yeah, this takes some really special and honestly, people who are doing their deepest work too. And this is why I feel like we need at that young age, this, you know, the conception through 10, we need our parents so much because that's going to shape how we show up in groups or even, you know, in conversation and people in public. This is really how our self-awareness and our consciousness is formed um, so that we can learn and, and understand what love is and even understand what it feels like when we're in a situation that we should not be in, that is that is unsafe to us, that's dangerous. What do you see for kids getting all these certificates and medals just for participating. Do you feel like we're setting kids up for a world that will kind of smack them when they grow into an adult by giving people participation medals and and gold stars um, just for doing kind of normal activities? Yeah. You know, prediction is a dangerous business. And and the problem with saying, you know, what type of world we're setting kids up for today is is nobody knows what the world's going to be like in 15 years. Um, You know, I I feel like a lot of what kids get today is not setting them up for the world that I grew up into, the world that we are in now. But uh, that doesn't mean that you know, the, the world is something that we make. And it, it might be that if we're giving everybody participation awards and you're feeling like you're the specialist snowflake in your class, uh, 
just by virtue of being there, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily set them up for today's world, but it might set them up for the world that exists in 20 years when if you feel bothered by anything outside, you just plug into virtual reality where all of a sudden you're the star of your own television show. And, and it's like sort of a Truman-esque world where every kid really is the star. I mean, which is sort of a dystopian version of the future, but that might be exactly what we're, um, you know, kind of creating the on-ramp for, for, um, you know, kids that are, are so habituated to not having to deal with real conflict that all of a sudden, like at, you know, 17, 18, 19, they pop out into the world. They find that there is real conflict and they're like, holy shit, I want to go back into my little virtual cyber shell where, where everything is reaffirming. I remember I was, I was dating a woman in the past and I had just hung out with her family and I understood kind of her context. She was very sheltered when she was growing up. And it was actually a reason why Jesse, I couldn't connect with her because I wasn't sheltered. I mean, uh, I was thrown to the wolves <laughs> at a very yeah, early yeah. age. And so it was hard for me to connect with her for people that are working right now. You know, that's why they're here on the podcast for their emotional growth, their emotional intelligence growth. What is one thing about cognitive bias that they really get to take away from our conversation? Understanding of cognitive bias is a is a great inroad to self acceptance of your own having made bad decisions because it is something that we are all saddled with. Every single one of us does. It's you know it's one of those things that was a feature, not a bug. When you know we we lived out in the wild and, and were cave people, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. At this point, most cognitive biases are bugs, not features. But just understanding that that exists, it it could I think I keep us from kicking ourselves when we're down quite so much. If we've made a bad decisions in the past that have gotten us to a place where we're not happy with now, just, just recognizing that like, if, if you, if you lose the debate, you really win. If you recognize you lost the debate, because uh, at that point you, you've recognized why you were wrong and presumably you won't be wrong the same way next time. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of feel like overall, it's a nice message that, that cognitive biases are a thing and that actually they're as well understood and, and a lot of them as well recognized as they are. Because even though it is a sort of a you know, built-in problem with, with the human mind, it's also something that you know, everybody else is set up with the same set of biases. And if, if you're you know, 20% less likely to make that kind of mistakes than the average person, that's actually a giant leg up for you. It's like you're still going to make mistakes. But um, you know, proportionally, you might do better than your average Joe because uh, – you're going to make less than he will. And the actionable for me too is is explore what these might be. You know, do your work, understand that this podcast is just a spark. So this is going to be maybe a turning point for you where you can actually start vetting uh, what things you have in your psyche that are memories from the past, injuries from the past. Jesse, we get so many emails about people that have old stories, right? So the story is that when I was this age, this thing happened to me. And ever since then, I haven't been able to trust a man. I haven't been able to trust a woman. It literally imprints in our nervous system, our CNS, yeah. uh, to be in this fight or flight state. Have, have you explored this part of cognitive bias, how it kind of wires people to just drop into that same story that's not of service? Yeah. I mean, in, this is something that we do actually get into on my podcast quite a bit is the study of learning and, you know, learn behaviors. It's just like you know, your brain is a learning machine. I mean, that's what we're doing. And we talk about, you know, getting more dopamine in the brain that accelerates learning and it kind of, you know, primes our brain to start laying new neural pathways. But, um, you know, most things, whether it's things that we're overly fearful of or things that we become addicted to, I mean, th these are all situations where, Something that we've learned has, has sort of gone wrong and taken on a life of its own, and we've we've accidentally trained ourselves to behave in a certain way in certain situations. Um, yeah, you know, I've got kind of a, a, a silly thing about myself, but when, when I was a really little kid, you know, I, I grew up in Oregon, and we had slugs in the backyard. I mean, that's just a, a thing you have. It's it's a state with a lot of greenery. And anyway, I, I thought slugs were kind of gross, but you know, slugs are kind of gross. It was not that big of a deal. But I remember I was a little kid and I told my dad, uh, slugs. And he's like, oh, why are you so worried about slugs? It's like, you're bigger than they are, whatever. And, and my, my dad, you know, well-meaning dad at the time, he's just like, why don't you step on one and kill it? And you'll see it's not such a big deal. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so like little, you know, three, four-year-old me, whatever I was, yeah, I, I stepped on the slug and, you know, splattered this disgusting thing that then was like stuck to the bottom of my baby foot and I couldn't get it off. And it was just all slimy and gross. And it went from being like, 
slugs are kind of gross to you. Oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to my four year old self. And, and like to this day, slugs just like I, I, I freak out. I get the chicken skin, um, you know, kind of reaction when I see a big slug. And, um, you know, it's something that if it were that important, I could probably work through it and do, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever. But, but because, you know, slugs can't outrun me, it's never been that, <laughs> that, that, that major of a problem. But, but it is definitely one of those things where because every time for the rest of my life since then that I've seen a slug, it's kind of, you know, given me the willikers. And, and, I, and I, I shy away from them. I'm sure that has become a self-reinforcing thing. And now I, I you know, cut a wide swath around slugs, which really makes no sense for an adult male to do. Slugs are not that fast. They're actually fairly slow. Um, I'm thinking about the way that this imprinted for you, though. And I think about my own life where I've done the work to unravel some of these events to see them now as an adult where they don't have any more charge on my nervous system. And this is really my exploration of consciousness, you know, different states of consciousness. Now, on your podcast, you talk about meditation, smart drugs, uh, cognition, but also, Jesse, you dive into, and I've, you've had some amazing guests from the MAPS organization, and this is a, a exploration of altered states of consciousness. Do you feel like in this explorative space of consciousness, these deeper levels of consciousness, can we do some imprinting there, some re-imprinting that will help to alleviate the pain of cognitive bias? Well, I, I love the fact that you can just drop the acronym MAPS and not even need to define it. That that's how, how well versed your audience is in uh, the, the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. Just it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And I believe that Dr. Robin Carhart Harris is probably at the forefront of the active research on this. He's a researcher over in the UK doing a lot of looking at what the brain is doing under the effects. Most of his studies have been on LSD, but I, I believe some on magic mushrooms now as well. But what, what seems to happen a lot of the time with people that are using psychedelic drugs is that regions of the brain that don't typically talk with one another all that much begin talking. It's like you, you start getting sort of, you know, crosstalk uh, among regions that have sort of been, you know, segregated apart from one another since somebody was a baby. Um, you know, babies have, have very, all, all parts of the brain kind of chatter with everything else while they're getting themselves wired up to know, like, you know, this is how I wiggle my left arm. This is how I laugh. This is how I raise my eyebrows, that kind of thing. Um, but, but then as, as we get better at operating, you know, our, our physical apertures, you know, our, our brain does a lot of pruning of connections amongst itself while we're in adolescence. And to a certain extent, firewalls go up that help us operate efficiently. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that makes psychedelics so interesting, um, both from a neuroscience perspective and also from an experiential perspective, is, is that we get ideas coming to us from um, – the wrong perceptual systems, you know, sounds seem to have like a color to them or things like that, just things that wouldn't happen in sort of normal perceptual reality. And, you know, along with that, I think is the ability for doing a lot of fresh learning because your brain is kind of in this childlike state for at least that period of a few hours where it is behaving in a, in a really unusual way. And that allows the potential for, you know, starting to lay down new tracks of sort of learning grooves, the, the you know, synapses, the fire together, wire together idea, yeah. um, just by kind of initiating that process. Now, of course, if you don't necessarily follow up on some of those ideas, just the experiences of a psychedelic trip in it in and of itself might not get you anything, which is probably why when you've talked about psychedelic studies um, previously, you've, you've probably mentioned how it's important to really think afterwards when you, you've sobered up, sobered up about what it was you experienced, what it might have meant, um, and how you can apply some of these ideas in everyday waking reality. Without integration, uh, it's just honestly more novelty for the brain. And we know the brain's so hungry for novelty all the time. It's like this uh, psychedelic experience, though, for, for all of us, if we choose to go that route, and it's not for everyone, uh, if we choose to go that route, it's so Im important, probably equally as important in my experience and, and from people that I've talked to that I respect, that you take just as much time to integrate, to journal, to do the work work of first having the conversation with yourself that probably, you know, nudged you, that brought you to that arena of exploring through psychedelics. It's just as important to do the integration. And, and I've found too, that there's people that kind of experience things just for fun. And then there's the rest of us, <laughs> you know, the people that are really interested in doing their work and, and experiencing psychedelic states, these deeper states of consciousness so that they can take the lessons back to this current world where let's be honest, Jesse, there is cognitive bias as being thrown at us all day long. It's like a cognitive bias soup as we drive around <laughs> and as we go into our Starbucks, right? So we're constantly under attack by all these 
people uh, in society's cognitive biases. Uh, what are some tactical things as far as health, emotional health um, that people can take away from the show? In other words, so we, we understand cognitive bias and, and it's something that we're talking about so that people have a deeper dive uh, to, and, into understanding what this actually means. So once they found out, okay, I'm raising my hand, I have some type of a cognitive bias that I really want to do some work on. What does the health practice look like that for them to jiggle it out and allow it to free up? Yeah, well, I, I guess it comes back to, um, you know, practice doesn't make perfect, but practice does make permanent. And you've probably talked about the book, The Power of Habit. And um, I forget what the new the new book by that same author is, but Charles Duhigg. You, Charles Duhigg. Thank you. Yeah, th- that that was a fascinating book. It's like if, if you were to do, um, I guess maybe the, like the one two punch takeaway punch number one would be learning about and identifying what cognitive biases might, you know, particularly prey on you, like where of, you know, look back at your five biggest or most recent mistakes and, and, you know, what, what category of bias might they fall into? And and then, um, you know, part two of that would be looking at how to, how to sidestep that sort of thing in the future. You know, is there, is there a way that you can, um, kind of short circuit that behavior when it starts to happen? And the, the power of habit is an amazing book for helping to, um, not just get rid of habits, but kind of rewire habits. So when, when whatever triggers habit A starts to happen, you kind of, uh, you know, redirect that energy into habit B, a habit that you like to have, or that would, um, you know, accomplish some of the scratch the same itch without the same, uh, second order consequences. And my practice too, along with understanding, like you said, once we identify it, uh, this Byron Katie's work, you know, she has four questions and these questions can be applied to really eradicate, just incinerate most biases. Probably not all, but most. And and there's four questions. The first one is, is it true? Is what I'm thinking, is what I'm going, that direction I'm going, is that actually true? The number two is, can you absolutely know it's true? Yes or no. And then the third is, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And then the fourth, and honestly, I believe the most powerful question is, who would you be without the thought? Who would you actually be without that thought? This this inventory is really a tactical way to dig into some of these uh, cognitive biases that honestly screw up our life and, and and keep us in this space of of hurting and a lack of being in touch with who we really are in ourselves. I'm, I'm curious how you're going to explore this for you, Jesse. Are, are you into any different states of exploring who you are. I mean, I feel like so many people that have podcasts and you're one of the OGs in the game. When I very first started, you're already doing it for a long time. Are you still exploring who Jesse Lawler is through your podcast? Yeah, it hasn't been such a self-experiment. Like honestly, for for me recently, I've been doing a huge amount of reading in a bunch of different domains because one of the things that I've, I've sort of realized about who my heroes are in life, it, one of the common elements that they have is that they've managed to synthesize information from several different domains in a unique way. And uh, so I, I've sort of been letting myself go kind of wild in my um, my Amazon and Audible accounts, getting books on a bunch of different things and, and sort of doing a, a deeper level of um, just knowledge gathering than I guess I, I might have in the, in the past and tried to be, um, you know, breadth rather than depth in some areas of my knowledge with the idea that you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, but it might give you the ability to tie things together in a really interesting way later. Because it, again, like I say, th- there are people I can think of that they didn't know what they were looking for either, but the fact that they had such a wide breadth of knowledge allowed them to see connections where other people might not have. Yeah, this connection piece too. It's always easy looking in reverse, right? It's like, yes, hindsight is twenty twenty. But we're living in the now. And so I just want to acknowledge you, Jesse, for putting out so much trustable information. I mean, gosh, I don't think there's any other podcast out there that's putting out so many resources and tools. And you do such a great job on your podcast, man, which is why I was stoked to have you on Wellness Force. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Where can they download the podcast and how can they dig into? I think you have a brain breakfast <laughs> that you send out, which I love that name. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for the uh, all, all the kind words there. There was a lot. Um, but uh, yes, so my podcast is called Smart Drug Smarts, just like it sounds. And you can find that at smartdrugsmarts.com. And in the footer, we've got, you can sign up for the RSS feed or iTunes or Stitcher or, or whatever. And um, and yeah, smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter is where you could get signed up if you want to get the brain breakfast newsletter that I do on a, uh, I, I like to think a weekly basis, but it's, it's probably more like every two weeks. It's kind of whenever I've got something that I've just got to get off my chest. 
Since we talked about brain power and consciousness and, and nocebo placebo on 97, here we are, man. This is going to be in the 200s. What can you say has changed or is it the same when you define wellness? You know, what is Jesse Lawler's definition of wellness in his current experience in his meat suit as we spin in a rock in the middle of space? I, I would say uh, wellness is rational reason for optimism, like to, to, to be optimistic and have some good solid foundation for why you're optimistic. I'd say that's a pretty good definition for me of wellness. Well, thank you for keeping us on that edge. Always curious, man. I want to quote you actually. And it was about experimentation from 97 before we say goodbye. And it was regards to N equals one, which people know you as a huge self experimenter. You said one of the greatest advantages of experimentation is just realizing that you can do it. It's a continuous reminder of our power to start changes in our own lives when you're just screwing with something else to see if it works in your own life. It's a constant reminder that we're always in flux and flux can't change, but at least you can direct it. Wow, that sounds pretty good. I'm I'm gonna put that on my uh, <laughs> on my my list of things to quote myself on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for keeping us I, curious, I man. Change a word. Okay, cool. Hey, we'll have you on the show for the four Pete at some point in 2019, because at that point, there's probably gonna be flying cars. I, I I look forward to it. I will have at least one more really weird self experiment between now and then that uh, that yeah we can rattle on about. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. Hey, my friend, thank you for hanging out and growing with me on today's show. Remember to hit subscribe, share this podcast with somebody you care about that you think gets to hear this message. Support the show by leaving a five-star review for the podcast right now, simply by tapping on your show artwork on your iPhone. Click that purple link that says review this podcast. It helps the show reach more conscious and smart people like you, and your voice will attract more world-class guests that want to come on the show. So let them hear your voice. For all the downloads, videos, links, and free resources mentioned on the episode, go to wellnessforce.com forward slash radio. And while you're at my house on the web, join us in the Wellness Force community newsletter on that page and I'll send you four free guides around staying healthy with your eating, moving, and sleeping while you travel. But don't let this conversation stop here. Join a group of people like you over at the Wellness Force community Facebook page. This is where we talk about the things that really matter. We share our wins, inspirations, struggles, and a lot more. So join us, tap on the show artwork on your phone and hit that purple link that says join the Facebook group and I will welcome you at the door. Okay, now you get to go out into your world and create impact for the people that you care about. So until I see you again real soon, I'm wishing you love and wellness.